Hello, everybody, and welcome to Meet My Pet. This is a program we're going to be doing for the whole Summer Discovery program. Uh, so it'll be the seven weeks of our Summer Discovery program. Uh, if you guys haven't signed up for the summer program yet, um, just check the cover photo up above this video, and you can find the website where you can sign up for our program. So we're still doing a summer program so you can read and you can attend these programs to earn badges, which will get you tickets for prizes for the summer. Uh, so thank you so much for coming. Today we are joined by the Research on the Road team and they're going to tell us a little bit about their pets. So let's get started. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us here at Research on the Road. Emily, go ahead. I've got a bonus. So this is my buddy Darwin. He's a ball python and a very handsome one at that. He's a, he's a full grown, full size boy. Uh, down on my leg here, I have a second ball python. She's a bit younger, her name's Iris. And they're different morphs, but they're the same species. So ball pythons are native to West Africa. They like uh, humid, dark, damp areas. They actually hide out in termite mounds where they're native. So where they're kept, they are in high humidity in little uh, in their enclosures, and they uh, they pretty much just hide all day in a little dark hide. But uh, they're also very cool to have out because they'll just wrap around and hang out with you for as long as you let them. So these are these are my little my little snakes. And tell us the name again. Uh, this one is Iris. She's a girl, and the boy, big boy, is Darwin. Iris and Darwin. Nice to meet you. <laughs> thank you, Mike. All right. Thank you for introducing your pets to us, Emily. Uh, we have a few more questions for you. I wanted to know where they stay at your house and what kind of habitat you built for them. Okay, so these guys like a lot of humidity. So for with my my first ball python, which is this lady, Iris, uh, for the first month or so, I had her in a, a regular glass a terrarium, and uh, I used coconut shred uh, substrate for her. So instead of like the the hamster wood shavings you it's uh, it's a coconut husk and it keeps humidity up higher but even with that here in california we don't have the humidity that they need and so even misting the the glass terrarium i just could not keep the humidity up for her so what i did was i transferred her and then when i got him just started him with that into a huge tupperware basically one of those storage containers. So it's made of plastic. It's, uh, I can't remember the, the full gallon size, but look at these two, they're so cute. Um, and so he's got a very large one. Hers is a bit smaller. They don't like a lot of space to move around because they, they're, you know, compact and they like to, to tighten themselves up even when they're in their home. They're not much for roaming around. But um, yeah, so you want to keep the humidity up pretty high. Um, they live in the wild. They live in like termite mounds and, and they like a lot of cover. They like a lot of warmth. They like a lot of humidity. So um, yeah, so try to keep the, the temperature up. I have a, a heat pad with thermostat on it. So I keep them at about 89 degrees and it clicks on and off. It just keeps it set. And then uh, the humidity I have set, and I can't remember offhand. Let me Google that real quick. For the exact numbers, because if you're, if you're setting up a tank, okay, so 55 to 60 percent ideal, that's what it is. And the, uh, the plastic storage containers keep it right there for me, whereas uh, even with with heavy misting and and everything I could give them, glass could only keep them at about 30, 35 because that's still much more humid than we have here in California. Just on if you walk outside, we're we're uh, often in the single digits. 
So. But so they are recommend not. these as a pet. Oh my goodness, yes. Look at these guys. How could you say no? Would you say they're difficult to care for for a first time snake owner? No, I do not think so. Um, I think that once I got the troubleshooting down, once I got them into the right enclosure, uh, they've had perfect sheds every, ever since then. So you, what you want is you want them to shed all in one piece. And that's a good sign that the humidity is right. They don't have any little pieces of, of skin stuck to them. So Darwin, as it happens, just shed last night. And so he looks gorgeous. He's nice and shiny. And it all came out in one piece. And uh, I, I can show it to you if you want. I've got it on hand. Want we go get it? Yeah, that would be cool. Okay, one second. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> You can tell it's it's nice and fresh shed because it's still pliable and and elastic, and so yeah, that's that's one one solid piece. This is his little face right here, and the tail at the other side. So good sign that that conditions are right, which which always makes you feel good. But yeah, so if you if like you think you have to spend a lot of money to take care of a snake at the right enclosure and stuff and then it turns out that you just need a plastic storage bin with latches because they will get out of anything but if you uh, if you keep them in a nice little container and keep them tight enough enough room to stretch out but not so much room that they feel nervous about it they're they're very happy little things and how often do they shed uh well darwin's been shedding like once a month which is unusual for a, a full ground size snake. Iris usually sheds once a month, but she's she's a young one, so that's more typical of her, but I just, I guess I keep him a little well fed, which is okay. <laughs> He's not overweight. Right. And where did you get your snakes? Well, okay, so both of them were actually gifted to me. Um, Iris came from Daniel, and he has a friend in New Mexico who breeds them. And so she was born there and uh, his, his friend was, was selling them and, and offered me one, so there we go. Darwin, on the other hand, uh, came from a different friend who was moving to Florida and couldn't keep his bets. So I was, I was fortunate to get Darwin free of charge and and uh, can't say no to that. So how long are each of them and how long will they get? It's hard to measure in in length because they're always balled up like this. Like I, I could try to stretch them out but they would not be happy about it. So Darwin is full grown, that, that I can say. And Iris is a female so she might get just a bit bigger uh, mostly rounder, not so much longer. So she, she'll someday be about his size, but for now, uh, she's still a young one. She's about a year old, I believe. And how old are they when they're full grown? Um, I, somewhere in between, uh, they can live up to like 40 years, um, in captivity at least. Uh, it's, probably only about 10 years, they think, in the wild. But I would imagine they're full grown by the time they're three or so. So she's, she's got a little growing up to do. He, I, I couldn't tell you how old he is because he's full grown when I got him. And uh, that could be uh, decades old for all I know. All right, what do they like to eat and how often do you feed them? So ball pythons, like many snakes, are rodent eaters. So they fortunately eat frozen mice on her part and rats on his part. So you could, at pet stores these days, they know you don't want to, to buy a live mouse and, and you know, that, that's difficult. So you, the snakes, they have little bags that are just a, a frozen mouse or a frozen rat 
you have to thaw them out in the fridge overnight and then you can you can hand them over and i feed iris once a week because she's still growing and so she gets a, a good sized mouse every week um darwin i give him a rat a smallish size rat every two weeks so that's why he's he's a, a healthy size and continuously shedding Uh, so these two are both ball pythons. Do you know why they're called that? Uh, yes, I do actually. So it's kind of, it's, it comes from their behavior in that they ball up like that, they scrunch up. So that um, they were like a, a former name of them was royal pythons. And so the, the Latin name actually is Python regius. And so you, you think regal, regis, that means royal in Latin. And so um, the reason they were called that is because supposedly African royalty used to wear them as jewelry because of their behavior of, of wrapping up like that. Like you saw how she just kind of hugged around my wrist. So might as well have a beautiful live bracelet. And uh, I guess that, that was popular among royalty according to, to old fables. Do you wear yours as jewelry? What'd you say? Do you wear yours as jewelry now? Oh, of course. <laughs> Look, I've got the boa, right? <laughs> and my the other one is it's still not quite there. So she's she can be a crown. She likes to hug my hat. Otherwise, I stick with the bracelet. All right. Do you have anything else to tell us about the ball python? Uh, is there anything else you'd like to know? There interesting little critters they uh most snakes lay eggs these guys lay eggs uh the exception is is boa constrictors and sea snakes are the uh, boa constrictors sea snakes and vipers um give live birth which is pretty cool uh they live birth not necessarily the way that we think about it as mammals so it's it it looks the same, but it's a different process. So they call it ovoviviparous. So ovo means egg, but viviparous would mean live birth. So it's live birth from an egg. So basically the eggs hatch inside them, and then they, they have what appears to be live birth. That's not these guys, though. These guys actually lay eggs. But uh, rattlesnakes and, and uh, boas, they have live birth. So these guys, they'll, they'll lay somewhere between four to seven eggs. Uh, they take about two months to hatch. And then you've got little nine, 10 inch babies that grow quickly. And do they sleep at night or in the day or? That's funny, I, I, they don't have eyelids. So you don't know, I don't know exactly when they're sleeping. Uh, when I went to feed Iris last time, I was kind of holding it in front of her and I, I was like, come on, don't give me a hard time. Cause sometimes, sometimes she's, she's fussy and she doesn't want to eat right away. And it, you, know, you gotta, you gotta entice her. And, um, but the last time I, I was just waving it around in front of her and she wasn't even looking at me. And I was like, what's going on? So I, I just tapped her a little bit and she went, what? <laughs> and then grabbed it. So uh, they do sleep. You can't tell when they're sleeping. Uh, it's not a particular, they're, they're considered crepuscular, which is another common thing for snakes is that they're active uh, in sunrise, sunset, that sort of time. So not necessarily most active at night or during the day, but kind of the in-between at the twilight. And uh, so, yeah, they, they, they catch naps here and there, but I can't tell you exactly I, uh, when I catch these guys sleeping or not because they're always curled up like that. It's, it's hard to say. All right, well, thank you so much. Can we see them one more time? Are they getting all over the place? Well, Iris has decided to wind herself around my cords. <laughs> just, just one second and I'll, I'll uh, uncoil her. There we go. All right, here's Iris, the little one. All right, nice to meet you, Iris. And she says the pleasure is all hers. 
And here's my buddy Doc Darwin, just sitting on the back of my chair. So he's he's a little more social. Yeah. But you know, he's also showing off because he did just shed. <laughs> he looks great. All right, thank you so much, Emily. It was very nice to meet your pets. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure.